Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your observations, your hot takes, your inquiries, your questions, and ultimately your comments on tennis and other things. I posted on the YouTube community tab 24 hours ago and got plenty of good comments from you guys, so thank you for that. I did not include Twitter this time. Sorry, Twitter people. Uh, I do believe this will be a somewhat shorter mailbag, but I always say that and then you never know what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, Miami, first week underway. Big news this week recently in the last couple of days about Nadal and his injury, about Barty and her retirement, that and more coming up after a shout out to our friends at Player Court. Player Court is the place to go if you're looking for a local coach, practice partner, or match. And I have arranged a 50% discount for you to join the player court community. If you need someone to play with, if you need video instruction, if you want a coach, player court, 50% off, playercourt.com backslash gilgross. Link will be in the description. Let us begin. First one from a member. I can't pronounce the username, uh, XP initials. I'll go with the initial initials. Uh, could you talk about the treatments Rafa got on court in Indian Wells? From what I saw, there were two different physical therapists with different approaches. I understand that none of them at the time knew it was a fractured rib, but I think they'd both be aware of the possibility and take that into, into account when treating Rafa. Well, the second I, I don't really know how, which two different physical therapists you're referring to because the treatment he got on court, I saw, but then in the final against Fritz in between sets, that treatment was off court. So I didn't see it and I don't know what it was, but as for the Alcaraz treatment where people were immediately joking about it, that it looked like the therapist was giving him a big bear hug that, and I'm not a doctor, but that obviously is not a treatment that would have been carried out had the physio known what the problem was. Had he known that the that there was a, a stress fracture there. There's no way because obviously he was stretching Rafa out there and we know that when a bone is fractured, stretching is not going to be the remedy and you don't really want to put pressure on a stress fracture. We know that. So, um, you know, I'm not in any position to to say, oh, they should have taken into account that there could have been a stress fracture there. I have never seen this injury personally in tennis. It's new for me. So I, I, I don't know, but I do feel confident in saying that that definitely wasn't the appropriate treatment for that. In fact, there probably is no appropriate treatment other than to stop playing immediately for a stress fracture. I know a lot of people who have experienced those in their foot and what do you do? You stop walking, you know, there's no surgery, there's no treatment. You just, you get in a walking boot, you take all the pressure off and you let it heal naturally. That's generally how a uh, stress, a stress fracture is remedied. And I don't know if that made it worse. I mean, I would hope not, but again, I, I don't feel medically qualified at all to speak on if it may or not. From Sergio, odds on Barty coming back and defending her Aussie Open title. I mean, I would be stunned if she came back that quickly. I mean, look, she's, uh, she's recently married. If not, the wedding is soon. But I'm pretty sure she had the wedding. I'm sorry if I'm not always up on these things as much as I could be. But uh, she's either recently married or engaged. There there might be family stuff that she's going to embark on now, right? She might want to have kids. I don't know. She said she has other dreams. She's going to want to give those a go. I don't know what they are at this point. But I'd be stunned if she came back that quickly. However... If you were to give me 50-50 odds, does Ash Barty ever hit a tennis ball again on tour professionally? I would definitely say yes. 
just because I think it's very, very enticing for any professional athlete who feels that they have the ability to come back. It's a very difficult thing to stay away from. It's infectious. It's addictive. And while Ash right now says that she is physically spent, says that she has nothing left to give, in two to six years, I mean, we're talking about a big window, it's very likely that she no longer feels that way, that she feels refreshed, and that she feels like she might be at some point ready to come back. That's already happened in her career. She stepped away. She said, right now, I'm not enjoying it. Right now, this is too much. And she took a break from tour and she came back and she was better than ever. So there is precedent for Barty doing this in the past. And I just wouldn't be shocked if we saw her come back. Look, there is a reason why we very rarely see players retire on their own terms. Because 95% of retirements are physically induced. Players retire when their bodies break down and they can no longer compete at an appropriate level or their bodies break down to the point where it is absolute hell continuing to play. And it, you know, you wake up every morning in pain and training hurts and playing hurts. That is why you hang it up. Your body tells you to stop. Players rarely retire when they feel great physically and everything is fine, but I think I've had enough. That's just not why players retire. So for Ash to step away at 25 when presumably while she's tired, her body would still allow her to keep playing, you have to very seriously take into account the possibility that with a body that will still allow her to play at a high level, that at some point she is going to make the decision to come back. So my money would be on that, but more on this later. I know there's some other angles that commenters have attacked this. Uh, going back to Rafa, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth here at the start. This is from Baton. Why didn't Rafa's physio confirm the diagnosis before the final? Or is it because Rafa didn't want to come to know the diagnosis before the tournament ends? Do you have an idea? I think I do have an idea. There wasn't any time between the semi and the final. To diagnose a fracture, you need imagery. It was an x-ray. And... I'm pretty sure if they had a day off, they could have or they would have been more ready to take the precaution of going in for an x-ray. But obviously, that can be a bit of a hassle. And that semifinal going late on Saturday, second up on Saturday, the final being the very next day at, you know, in the afternoon... It's recovery time. You know, it's time to get ready for the final. It's time to... It's not really... Look, It's all I'm saying is the schedule is tight there. And that is probably why there wasn't an x-ray done. And I think if this were... If this would have been a, a, a major final or something like that and there was a day off, I think they probably would have taken the time to uh, have an x-ray done. But there just there's very little time in that scheduling. And that would be the reason to, to answer the question. From Sanji, do you think the Rafa injury would be a blessing in disguise for him? At his age, I think he's playing too many tournaments on clay. So for me, playing just one or two tournaments before Roland Garros will be more than enough for him. He does not need to play a lot of tournaments to perform well in Grand Slams. His last triumph in Australia and Roland Garros 2020 showcased the perfect veracity of my assumption. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that there's a lot of truth to this in the sense that, you know, my sense has been that the whole like Monte Carlo, Barcelona, being that it's in Spain, Madrid, Rome schedule, leading up to Roland Garros, is a lot for Nadal. And I don't think that he's handled that stretch as well 
in the last three or four years as well as he handled it for so many years in the prime of his career. I think that there have been dips, not only physically, but even emotionally for Rafa going through that run of tournaments. And of course, the one that sticks out is Barcelona because that one is uh, is a 500. And I will also say that Monte Carlo is the only Masters 1000 tournament that is not mandatory. So there is no penalty on your ranking if you don't play Monte Carlo. So I do think that there is opportunity and there has been opportunity for Rafa to cut back on that schedule and to make a decision about either Monte Carlo or Barcelona. And it likely would be smart for him to not play one of them. Madrid is the tournament that I think is probably the least effective for preparing for Roland Garros. I think the conditions are just completely different. So maybe Madrid would be a sacrifice in that respect, but it's in Spain and it's a Masters 1000 and it's a mandatory one. So that doesn't seem like it would be a possibility. You got to play Madrid, Barcelona, or Monte Carlo on the chopping block. Obviously Barcelona, another one in Spain. Rafa wants to play that. So uh, again, I think... I think it would have made a lot of sense for Nadal to cut back on the clay court schedule, but now you have to look at the other side, which is how is he spending his time? There is rest. There is kind of training blocks that I think are very essential, very useful. But then there's injury recovery, which is not useful. And while I clearly misjudged the condition that Nadal was in coming into the Australian Open, given that he ended up going all the way. Even though I don't think he was at his best level in the beginning stages of the tournament, uh, still, he was clearly and obviously, in hindsight, in good enough condition to win the tournament. It's not ideal to have to rest while recovering from injury. It's much better to rest on your own terms and continue to train and work out in the ways that are ideal for preparing for a stretch of competition. So I don't think the Rafa injury will be a blessing in disguise. And I think if he ends up coming back and winning Roland Garros or having a good clay court season in the second half when he's able to play. I don't think that we should be spinning it as, well, look at that. He got injured and it helped him. It's probably just would be another example of he was able to take the court and find enough fitness quickly enough in spite of his injury, not because of his injury. From SLC, Might have addressed this, but what matches did you catch at Indian Wells? Or maybe just do a recap of your first time experience there. I I don't want to talk about too much that I feel like wouldn't be entertaining video or audio. But uh, I saw Sinner uh, play RBA, dismantle RBA. It was probably my favorite match of the tournament. Not because it was a good match, but because it was such an incredible display by Carlos, and I got to see that really up close, and it was awesome, and I enjoyed it. Um, I saw a little bit of Fritz Munar in the third set tiebreak. That was probably the most dramatic action that I saw. I saw Nadal versus Evans. Always fantastic to watch a legend like Rafa, the gravitas, uh, being able to watch how he goes about his business in between points when you're there live is always kind of an experience. I saw a bit of Kerber Sviatek. That was a good match. I saw Sinner play Benjamin Bonzi. Gritty performance by Yannick. I was able to kind of evaluate, I think, where Sinner is at from up close. I saw Hercotch and Stevie Johnson also. And that was a fun one as well. Those are the matches that I remember. Maybe I saw more. Uh, But I like the event. Beautiful setting. Really nice grounds. Didn't find myself in a lot of matches with a great environment. I'm very partial to that. I love a good 
energetic crowd. And actually probably the, the best crowd was for Stevie, the USC product with the California support. But that I was kind of missing just that a little bit of energy I think was lacking for my experience. Um, even on center court when Nadal was playing Dan Evans, I thought a little bit of energy lacking. So that was one complaint, but really an amazing place to watch. And the practice courts are glorious. I mean, such a tremendous setup for the viewer when it comes to the practice courts in Indian Wells. So that's a huge perk. So I loved it. I loved it. Really liked the desert also. Just a very magical place, in my opinion. All right, there's a couple of takes on Barty here. YIV says, Barty's decision of retirement seems to be one of the bravest as far as career decisions are concerned. Oops, wrong way. Uh, Benton says, absolute bonkers decision by Ash Barty. Don't understand it at all. And to do it mid-season is bizarre. Something else is going on. I hope she changes her mind and returns soon. So you have a spectrum of reactions to Ash Barty's decision to retire. And I tend to agree more with the pro Barty side of this, which is the whole world is expecting Ash to keep playing. Do your job. You're a tennis player. Go out there and do it. To me, it shows more strength than anything that she looks within herself and feels like, you know what? I don't really want to do this right now. I don't want to do this with my life in the immediate future. So I'm good. When all of the external expectation is completely the other way. Everybody expects Ash Barty to continue to play tennis. She's not really worried about what other people think. She's not worried about uh, or you know, insecure about any of those external factors and she's doing what she wants to do. To me, that's strong. It's not weak. Uh, it's not like she is shying away from competition here. Uh, in reality, she has accomplished her dreams and her goals. Her goal was to win Wimbledon. She has been number one in the world. If that was a goal, I'm not sure if it really was, but she, she wanted to win Wimbledon. And... Now she's won her home major, the Australian Open. She clearly is not someone who would like to chase the all-time greats in the sport from a legacy perspective. That probably doesn't motivate her. And physically, she's feeling spent and she's feeling worn out. And you know what a lot of players do? What we see all the time? We see players accomplish their goals and then they dip and they don't play very well. And they hang around because that's what everyone expects and... They're afraid of the next chapter, which, by the way, most tennis players are. Your whole life, you are a tennis player, and that's what you do, and that's your livelihood. It's generally very scary to leave that, either voluntarily or involuntarily. Very scary. Who am I? What's my identity? What am I going to do in the next phase? Barty's excited for that challenge. It's very unique. It's very different. Uh, but I kind of lost my train of thought there a little bit. Um, I guess it's admirable to me. To me, it's admirable. Um, I don't know, like trying to understand the other side. I don't, I don't know that I, I really can. I mean, it's bad for us as fans, but I think that's kind of, obviously that's purely selfish. And from Barty's perspective, does she, does she owe us something? No, not really. I don't think any players, you know, really Oh, fans, anything um, other than when they take the court and a lot of people, you know, the, the tournament is or the, you know, the rights holders are paying a lot of money and the sponsors are paying a lot of money and they're being paid a lot of money. 
and the fans have paid a lot of money to watch them. The commitment that I think the players have is when they take the court to be 100% invested in what they're doing. That's the commitment. But they have no commitment to play tennis to us. They they just don't. So I can't um, I can't criticize Ash at all. I'm, I admire it. She's doing what she wants to do in her life. So that's strength, I, I think. Uh, not everyone... Yeah, I guess what I was talking about is how a lot of players have these dips in their careers and, and they might never be the same after they lose motivation. Why hang around uh, and and go through that phase if you're not going to be happy? And and so many players are not happy. So that's never been Ash, which I think is awesome because both times she's felt like she's not going to be happy. She said, okay, I'm, I'm done. Because ideally... Ideally, players would be happy. <laughs> so, uh, the, yeah, I have no desire, you know, for Ash to stick around if if uh, she doesn't want to put herself through the physical training con con continuously and she wants to do other stuff. Andrew Torres, uh, what will it take for the ATP to reconsider or at least objectively and consistently enforce umpire abuse, racket abuse when it poses a threat to others, etc.? Following the Zverev umpire incident in Acapulco, Kyrgios in Indian Wells, and now Brooksby in Miami, actually making contact with the ball boy, it seems like there's no clear or distinct consequence for situations like this. Regardless of intent, I was surprised Brooksby was not defaulted for what happened today. And what are your thoughts on the situation as a whole? Edit. Add another incident from Miami today with Jordan Thompson hitting a ball in frustration so close to the ball girl, she had to duck away. The ATP's disciplinary arm is just so soft, so unbelievably soft. And there are consequences to that. And I think a lot of fans are frustrated with how little accountability there is for incidents like this, which make a lot of people incredibly uncomfortable. When you have ball boys who a lot of the times are volunteers— a lot of the times are kids. In the case of Miami, not a kid, grown man. Um, but, you know, they should not be subjected to rackets being hurled at them, whether it be on purpose or by accident. And in Brooksby's case, he's throwing the racket into the corner. That's where ball guys stand. That's where ball people stand. Always. This isn't that hard. Uh, same with, like, the Djokovic ball incident. That's where lines people stand. Whether you intend or not to, and in this case, in all cases, except for Zverev um, hitting the umpire's chair, in all these cases, they do not intend to have a, uh, to involve another human in their hitting of a ball or throwing of a racket. None of them intended that. However, there are humans on the back wall, always. This is just a constant. So there's no excuse. There's really not. And I think Carlos Bernardes um, should have... You know, I, to me, it seemed like that should have been a default. Um, the rule is that if there's an injury to the on-court personnel, that's an automatic default. Or if it's intentional, then that's another automatic default. And I think Bernarda said, well, okay, there's no injury and Brooksby didn't mean to hit the ball boy. Um, but I, I, I think that's probably a pretty poorly written rule. I think if you... Uh, if you act recklessly enough, I think, to make contact with on-court personnel when you are throwing your racket, uh, I wouldn't mind that being a default. And look, I'm not, and if you've been following me for a while, you know I am not, I am not a, someone who is automatically disgusted by smashing rackets or arguing with umpires. Not that guy. However, there needs to be a very, very hard line drawn 
at endangering others or disrespecting the humanity of others. It's not that difficult. Smash your racket. You might upset certain fans, but I think there's a place in the game for for that to occur, for outward frustration to be shown, and for fans to decide if those are the players that they're going to like or if those are the players they're not going to like. I think that's fine. Um, or arguments with umpires, which occur in basically every every sport. It's all completely normal. But when it comes to endangering others or when it comes to saying things that in other sports have you ejected in baseball, in basketball, you get teed up. Um, I think that those lines need to be drawn. What I don't understand is this overall, I think, attitude from the ATP that they don't want to punish their players. I don't understand where it comes from. Do they think that their product is so flimsy that if they suspend players that it's going to impact their bottom line negatively? Because I do, do not think that is true whatsoever. I do not think that there's going to be a significant dip in ratings or ticket sales if Alexander Zverev is off tour for two months or a month. I do not think there's going to be a dip in ratings or ticket sales if even a Novak Djokovic does not play the Australian Open. I think you can have a I think you can have a large percentage of what you had, and I know that might upset people, but I would say it for Federer and Nadal. Certainly, you know I'd say it for Federer and Nadal. I don't think one player makes a big difference. In the grand scheme of things, the product is tennis. The product are these tournaments. The vast majority of fans are going to the Miami Open regardless of who is playing. They are watching the Australian Open final regardless of who is playing. And the financials, again, I mean, you know, I talked about this in Australia a lot. These financials aren't that volatile, right? So like the, for the for the TV ratings, it actually would affect, you know, who's playing does matter, right? Like Barty rated really high because she's Australian and she rated really high in Australia. Uh, Novak or Nadal would rate much higher than Team and Zverev, like what we got at the U.S. Open. That's totally true. Um, however, again, these TV deals are negotiated on like 10 year averages and it all averages out to be an accurate reflection of what the interest in the sport is, not the interest in a particular player. One match doesn't change it. One tournament doesn't change it. They got to be harder. They got to be stiffer in my opinion, or they're going to face the consequences, which is a lot of fans just annoyed and generally disgusted with some of the things we've seen in the last month or so. And players need more than a slap on the wrist because I really think that this uh, this should be this shouldn't be as common as what we're seeing right now. I don't think it's difficult. I get that players get angry. Hold on to your racket. Okay. Smash it face down and it won't go anywhere. Uh it's not hard. It's not hard to to not endanger other people on the court. Brooksby did like three things yesterday. Young kid, hope he learns from this. First offense. He did three things yesterday that, that were dangerous to the other people on court. And it's ridiculous, you know? I mean, have have a little bit of uh I don't care how how angry you are, have a little bit of caution here with the other people who are on the court with you. Very little excuse for it. All right, from Gene. Hello, uh, Gil. Today it's been confirmed that both team and Vavrinka will be back playing at the Marbella Challenger. What a treat that will be as they are two of my favorite one-handers to watch on tour besides Federer. So my question to you, what are your favorite matches from them against the Big Four in Grand Slams, Masters, etc. of your memory? Thanks for the great content you always bring. Cheers, Gene, from the Game to Love podcast. Um... I don't know what, what you mean by from the Game to Love podcast, but 
but cheers. Cheers to you as well. Um, for team against the big three, is that those are the parameters, right? Oh, the big four. Uh, well, team Djokovic in the semis of Roland Garros in 2019 was was a, a really, really good match. Even though it was windy, I thought it was still a, a very good match. That's the one uh, that comes to mind. And then Vavrinka, you know, so many amazing battles with Djokovic as well. So many good ones. But the, uh, I think the, I think it was 2016, that Australian Open, um, where it went deep into the fifth. That was one of the best matches of the decade. Um, let me, let me see if I'm, let me see if I have the year right. You guys know I'm not always great with the specific years. No, that was that was the U.S. Open in 2016. When did they play? 15. 15 they played in the semis. And um, they played in 14 too. I'm actually thinking of the, the meeting in 14, aren't I? Yeah. Anyway, uh, Vavrinka, Vavrinka Djokovic was magic on a pretty consistent basis as far as the quality of play. Um, but yeah, uh, team and Vavrinka return. That's exciting, right? From Vinit, from Mr. Lima here or Mrs. Lima. Hey Gil, do you think this Miami idea of using a large football stadium and converting into a tennis stadium? I think it's cool and wouldn't mind seeing it used more often on tour. I wanted to know if you're behind the idea. And if so, do you have any ideas of anywhere else you'd like to see it used? I got to go to the event and feel it out, but I don't think I am behind the idea. I think it, it looks maybe somewhat cool and glitzy, but I think the best courts... When the fans are closer to the tennis, it's better. It's louder. It's It just makes for a better atmosphere. And empty seats don't look good. And sometimes these big stadiums, they just don't look as good because empty seats are the ugliest thing in sports. They are. And filled seats are what we want. So um, I think it's a little bit vast and... Can, can feel a little bit barren at times when the stadiums get too big. And then you have the geometry of it and the angles, and I don't know how good those are. I think the best courts are usually designed for tennis, and they're usually a little bit smaller, generally. So I think a lot of people miss the Key Biscayne setting for Miami. Although that stadium was pretty bare bones and not not very up to modern standards. I did attend that version of Miami, but I haven't been to the new Miami. I'll get there I'm sure probably within the next couple of years. Pretty confident in that. Josh Kiddo, hey Gil love the show. Two questions I wanted to ask. A lot of commentators have mentioned how slow Indian Wells is and that it plays slower than some clay courts. This may explain why some natural hard quarters like Medvedev and Murray have always struggled there, but then some natural hard quarters on the women's side who are not particularly great clay quarters, Osaka, Andrescu, and Azarenka, have done well, I think you're trying to say. Is this just down to the weirdness of Indian Wells conditions, particularly how it plays in day versus night, or are there specific reasons why some players may play well on a slow hard court, but not on a clay court or vice versa? Oh, for sure. Because the movement is still hard court movement. So there's definitely, you can't draw a perfectly straight line from clay quarters are going to do well on uh, at Indian Wells or vice versa from Indian Wells to clay courts. Like Osaka moves terribly on clay. Terrible. Um, I, I don't think Azarenka moves very well on clay either. Uh, and I feel like, I don't know about Andrescu, but growing up in... North America, I'm sure Andrescu is kind of lacking in clay court experience as well. So the movement is important. Uh, there are some weird things, though, with Indian Wells. You know, Dimitrov doing great there. Kerber doing well there. 
let's not forget it's a pretty unique setting and some players i think are very much energized by it grigor dimitrov was saying he was asked why he does well there and he didn't even talk about the conditions he was like i love the mountains i love the desert and grigor being kind of this lover of outdoors and nature i think he just feels freaking great when he's there and he just loves it so it gives him an emotional boost we should never you know, we should always remember that. Like when you are playing the U.S. Open, that is a certain feel. Some players are going to hate that. Some players have talked about how they hate that. You're getting in a cab. You're sitting in traffic. You're not going to see any trees in Queens, really. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of noise. How are you going to respond to that? Versus you go to Indian Wells and... You're going to feel like it's going to have a much different feel. It's going to be a lot quieter. There's going to be a lot more space. And you're going to see mountains. And you're going to see nature. And uh, it's, it's different. So I think that's part of it. Probably underrated. We don't talk about it enough. Is the environments that might affect players mental state when they're at events next one is uh this is a question i feel stupid asking as a big tennis fan why is being left-handed hold on i need some water why is uh why is being left-handed such an advantage i understand why it can be difficult for an opponent having to hit different shots than they would normally hit to mess up a lefty's forehand slash backhand, but it also seems that the lefty shots, particularly the serve, have more spin and spin away from the opponent. Is there a particular reason for this? Are the rackets and the courts designed with right-handers in mind, or does this some have some kind of effect on it? I could go like 15 minutes on this probably, but the reason why lefties, you know, have more spin on it to is because they they grow up and their games develop in order to beat righties and righties grow up and develop their games also in order to beat righties. For example, righties develop kick serves out wide on the ad side and down the T on the deuce side. And in the, in the, time span of a player's life as a tennis player, any righty pretty much, they will hit, you know, double or triple the amount of kick serves to those directions that they will the other way. Lefties are going to always want to master the slice serve to the righty back end because it's very effective and it it's unique and it bothers righties. So there are a lot of patterns that advantage lefties. And you might say, well, don't righties get the same advantage against lefties? For example, um, why don't righties hit slice serves to the lefty backhand on the deuce side? Isn't that the same thing? Yes, it is the same thing to a lefty hitting a slice serve on the ad side to a righty. The difference is lefties are used to it. Lefties see it all the time. They play righties all the time. Righties aren't used to it. For righties, it's a changeup. For lefties, it's the norm. So, yeah, it's uh, there's patterns there that righties just aren't used to, that are effective, and lefties get to hone, get to master those patterns. Righties, um, righties are playing changeup. Lefties are getting to do the same thing. And then when lefties play lefties, it's it's fine because you don't have that, you know, you, they're obviously they're on equal footing there. So definitely an advantage to play lefty. Um, I could have gotten more into the X's and O's, but I'm not going to do that right now. From Reeves, maybe Barty retiring will give window for a dominant power to rise. I would hope Spiontek will win a few more slams and achieve some sort of superstardom. Also, one of the physios looked like he was giving Rafa chest... Comp okay, we covered that. Maybe he crap cracked the rib then. Yeah, 
the last angle that we didn't address for for Barty is what is the effect of women's tennis? It's terrible for women's tennis. Terrible. For me, Barty was someone who got got me to my television screen to watch Ash Barty because she was uh, she was truly elite, truly number one material, head and shoulders above the rest. Had the X factors in her game to separate herself from the pack. It was fun to watch. Iga is in the midst of doing the same thing. You know, she's been developing as a as a teenager, and now at 20, she has made incredible progress. And I wanted to see Barty and Sviantek go head-to-head on a regular basis, and I thought that that was going to be the premier rivalry on tour over the course of the next couple years. And then this news comes out. So now it looks like... Iga and you know it's not a guarantee a guarantee at this point but it kind of looks like Iga is beginning to separate herself now who's her foil who's her rival we've had a pretty strange year on the tour already on the WTA side of things with Sabalenka the world number two having a really bad year Muguruza a former top five player and a multiple Grand Slam champion looking like she was going to carry momentum at the end of 2021 into 2022 that has not happened Bedosa's had a good year um Sakari's kind of had uh had a good Indian Wells at least in a, in a good year but I don't know you know what the top of the sport really looks like but who's going to be Ego's rival is my question right now are you know is it Sakari Bedosa you know do Sabalenka Muguruza turn it around um are we going to see a Halep resurgence? She just got injured again, so that's going to be put on hold. Um, like how how far away, or or you know, will the this awesome teenage crop of uh, Maria Osorio and Layla Fernandez and Emma Raducanu and Clara Towson and Zhang Shen Wen, um, how far away are they? You know, there's a lot of questions there. From Roman, where do you think Carlos Alcaraz can improve his game apart from his small lapses of concentration on his serve? For me personally, I think a lot about his running forehands in defensive positions, still leaving something to be desired. Obviously, it is an incredibly difficult shot to execute, but oftentimes when his run when he runs to the forehand, he just loops the ball middle of the court, and I see it as an underutilization of his world-class speed when he is not able to put a competitive ball back in play. Good observation. He does need to train that, in my opinion. He needs to train his forehand defense. It doesn't go... He doesn't neutralize that well there. He can counterattack, but I also think he misses a lot on the run on his forehand side. Better on the backhand side when he hits open stance. He's good at that. But it's really a serve. I know you said apart from that, but that's what it is right now. His first serve... He's probably the worst spot server in the top 50. I mean, it's middle of the box, low percentage. He can't hit a spot. It's it's really bad spot serving. And he is going to learn that if he's focusing on pumping up the miles per hour, it's not the thing to focus on because the best returners in the world are not going to be bothered at all if you're serving 138 into the middle of the box. The best returners are, it is not going to do anything to them. You have to hit your spot. So that's that's what it is for Alcaraz right now, in my opinion, and uh, consistency and, and shot selection and being more steady. Because you gotta be steady, in my opinion, still, unless you are going to, unless you are going to have like this really kind of complete attacking game where you have a big serve where you have amazing net play when you hit Alcaraz is pretty close to that but I still think the next level you know if he wants to be a complete player he needs to increase his uh shot tolerance and his steadiness or we'll see like what we saw in the first set against Nadal at Indian Wells hey Gil uh this is from Sam uh I asked this question a couple weeks ago uh, but I just wanted to give it another shot here. Which top 10 player would improve most dramatically if they could significantly improve their weakest spot? 
Tsitsipas slash slash return, Medvedev volleys, Berrettini topspin backhand, etc. And how much better would they be? Thanks. I love the show and tune in for every video. Appreciate that. Um, well, let me eliminate Med, Med, Medvedev volleys. I want to eliminate that. I don't think that, I mean, think about how many, how many volleys or how many chances there are to come to net. You know, it's significant, but we're talking about a fraction or a percentage of improvement there. When it comes to the Tsitsipas slice, or more importantly, the return, when it comes to Tsitsipas return, it is literally a weakness that can be attacked at will. Medvedev volleys, I mean, you can drop shot them, but it's not really, you're going to have to do a lot more. It's, it's not, it's a more difficult weakness to exploit. But when it comes to the Tsitsipas backhand return, you're you're giving players a clear plan. When it comes to the Medvedev backhand, you're giving players a clear plan. Um, sorry, Berrettini backhand. God knows Medvedev doesn't need to improve his backhand. Uh, but the Berrettini backhand. Um, I am going to give you a left field answer to this question, though. If Medvedev or Zverev had an elite attacking forehand, that would be a pretty dramatic improvement for those guys. And it would be a very, very, very scary player. If you gave Medvedev, Team, Tsitsipas, Berrettini, Nadal, any of those forehands, Federer, obviously, uh, any of those forehands. Very, very scary if you give them forehands. That's one of their big weaknesses that's not talked about because it's not necessarily a weakness so much as it is a lack of strength, right? Berrettini's forehand, you're not like, or sorry, oh my God, I keep saying these names wrong. Medvedev and Zverev's forehand, it's not like, Oh my God, their forehand, how brutal they keep missing or they keep, you know, they're getting attacked. That's not how it is. It's just so many players have that forehand weapon. They do not. What if they had it? It would be quite the package. So that's kind of what I think about more than anything uh, because the Tsitsipas return and the Berrettini back end, that's a weakness, but what about lack of strength? That should be considered as well as something that um, would be a dramatic improvement for some of these guys. Uh, but of the three you gave me, by the way, Tsitsipas return. I think that would be a pretty dramatic change. All right. Um, I think that is going to be it. I'm going to end it on that. There are a couple more questions, unfortunately, that I did not get to. Uh, I apologize. If you uh, feel strongly about your question, you can ask it again in the next mailbag. Uh, second week, I will be ramping up my coverage of Miami beginning especially on Wednesday of next week. Looking forward to that. Might have some videos even before then. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.